Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's message. Our hope with this content is that it would help you come to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and lead others to do the same. If you're grateful for this word, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and also you can partner with what Jesus is doing here at Elevate City through giving. There's a link below for that as well. Here's today's message. I can't wait for you to hear it. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Thomas and I serve on staff as our community pastor. Um, and I could not be more pumped to be up here to be kicking off year three of Elevate City. Come on. Hey, I just make some noise if you love the new way to be human series that we finished off last week. I absolutely love that we have a lead pastor who takes us into deep waters and he teaches us about the truth of the Holy Spirit. I cannot be more grateful for this man, for Joey McLaughlin, and just his teaching and his dedication to this word and the scripture. Um, guys, things got a little weird in the Elevate City offices during the Holy Spirit series. Um, Joey, you think he was out of control up here? He was out of control every day. Um, and I was here for it. Like, it was awesome, and I want more of it. Um, but tonight, we are starting a two-week series called So Loved. Let me hear you say, So Loved. Our prayer for you tonight and over the next couple of weeks is that you would be overwhelmed by how much God loves you, that you would not be able to run away, that you would know that God is for you and that he loves you and that he is absolutely crazy about you. So you guys know the drill. If you have your Bibles, hold them up, hold them up. We are a people of a book. Our understanding of God is not shaped primarily by experience, tradition, popular opinion, or what we are comfortable with. Our understanding of God is shaped by the word of God. He is, it is our first source, final authority, the greatest love story ever written, and the best part of it all, it's true. Amen. We're going to be in John chapter 3 tonight, John chapter 3, a familiar verse, um, and this is going to be the passage of scripture that we are all going to read out loud, so I'm going to invite you to stand again and read this passage of scripture with me. John chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, 1, 2, 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You guys can go ahead and sit, sit down. As I was praying and preparing for this message, I was thinking about this familiar verse. This is quite possibly one of the most popular, one of the most famous most well-known verses in the entire Bible, and I couldn't help but think about an experience that Lauren and I had a couple weeks ago. Um, a couple weeks ago, we got to go to the Canadian Rockies um, with some close friends of ours, and it was incredible. Like, one of the most beautiful places, hands down, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my entire life. Um, I'll never forget the first time we woke up that morning and just saw the mountain range and how beautiful it was. But one of the things that I noticed and the people we were, we were with that we talked about is that the people who lived here, the people who called this place home and were surrounded by this beauty every day had become desensitized to how beautiful their home was. They had forgotten how beautiful the mountains were or how beautiful God's creation was. They forgot what it was like to summit that mountain for the first time and stare in awe of how beautiful everything is. They forgot what it was like to be there at night after the sun has gone down and be able to look in the sky and see every star so clearly. They forgot what it was like to stand in the vast open valleys and just be amazed by nature and God's creation. And the reality is tonight that I believe that some of us have done the same thing with John 3.16. We've become desensitized to the reality of this verse. We have forgotten our first love. We've forgotten how God shows us and tells us that he loves us in this verse. We've forgotten the first time that we realized that Jesus summited that mountain and that he paid a brutal death for you and me and our sin. 
we've forgotten what this verse means for us. And tonight, some of you need to see how beautiful the mountain range of God's love still is. And some of you guys need to experience the beauty of God's love for the first time. Elevate City, I want to preach a message to you tonight titled 10 Words That Changed Everything. 10 Words That Changed Everything. In order to realize the significance of this verse, you have to recognize the significance of for God. You see, you can't understand God's love if you don't understand who it is that loves you in the first place. And let me just say, I could talk about God all night. We could, we could do a sermon series on sermon series about the character and attributes about who God is. We could talk about so much about who God is. But the one thing I want you to write down tonight is that God is holy. God is holy. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says, There is none holy like our Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. God is called love three times in the Bible, yet he is called hundreds of times. He is called holy time and time again. The word holy is found 431 times in the Old Testament and 180 times in the New Testament. God is holy. The word holy in the Bible, it means set apart or other than. In a verse about God's love, tonight it's important for us to see that his love flows from his holiness. His love flows from his holiness. Do you realize that you are loved by a holy God? It's because of his holiness that we can experience his love like no one else. I love what Revelation 4, and I know what you're thinking, we're going to Revelation in a John 3, 16 message? Absolutely. Come on, people. Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 says, And around the throne room, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Like God creates these wild, weird, set apart, holy creatures. Why? Because he is holy. And what are they doing? They are worshiping every single second of every day because that is how holy he is. One of the theologians who helped me realize this was A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer writes a book called Knowledge of the Holy, Knowledge of the Holy. And in this book, Tozer um, talks about 24 characteristics or attributes of who God is. He talks about his love. He talks about his grace. He talks about his self-sufficiency. He talks about his sovereignty. But what is the book called? Knowledge of the Holy. Because Tozer knew that all of these attributes, all of these flowed from his holiness. He says this in his book, he says, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Because he is holy, his attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God, we must think of it as holy. He is holy, church. Some of us have this misconception of God, and we think about him as our, this girlfriend or this boyfriend that is following us around all day and is just begging for our attention. Like He's just begging for us to realize how much we love him, and he's just waiting. He's just sitting here going, oh, I really hope Elevate City sees how much I love them. I just hope that they see it tonight, and that is not God. Do you know who God is? He is the holy king of the universe. He is the one who always has been and always will be. He is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the highest one. He is the strongest one. The one who is beyond compare. We are talking about God, the holy God. Grace, it's his invention. 
Kindness, it's his personality. Love, it's his language. Compassion, family, joy, none of these would exist apart from God. He paints every sunrise and he paints every sunset. He formed the mountains and he holds the oceans in the palm of his hands. This is the God that we are talking about in John 3, 16. He is the one who is, who says, I am. He is Yahweh, the one who the Jews knew as our very breath. He's God. He is so much bigger than we could ever comprehend. Do you want to experience the love of God tonight? Then look to God because he is the standard of love. He exceeds the standard of love. Do you see him this way? Like when you approach your time with the Lord and you open up God's word, do you see that this is the God that you are reading about? When you pray, do you realize that this is the God that you are talking to? When you enter into this room and you worship, do you realize that this is the God that you are worshiping? But in order for us to realize the significance of this verse, you need to also recognize that for God so loved. He loved. We all want to be loved. Like all of us, if we're being honest, we have this desire to be loved. Ever since we were born, we have this desire wired into us, created in us to be loved. We want it in our lives. We want to hear from our dad that he's proud of us. We want to hear from that friend in our lives that they care, that they care for us. We have this desire But one of the biggest reasons we don't understand the magnitude of God's love is because we compare his love with the love that we experience here. We think about that friend who betrayed us or that family member who hurt us or that parent who walked out on us or that relationship that ended so messy or possibly is still so messy. And this creates this inner voice in us where we start to say, does anyone love me? Does anyone care? Am I unlovable? Am I worth it? Do people remember me? And we say this over and over and we take these experiences and we mirror them with God's love. Tonight we need to see that love, it's sacrificial and love shows commitment. And God's love, it's perfect. It's perfect. You see, in a world that knows no commitment, you need to hear tonight that God is committed to you. His love is committed to you. His love is not going to walk out on you. It is here to stay. His love is the most constant personal affection that we can experience on this side of eternity. It will never get messy or tainted. God's love is holy. God's love for you is intimate and personal. He loves friendship with us. Our definition of love would change so much if we started to look at the God who is love, who who exceeds the standard of love. Like tonight you need to hear that God loved you personally. He loved you. It is not a collective us. It is a you personally. His love is intimate and it is personal and it is for you. But in order for us to realize the significance of this verse, you also need to recognize that God so loved the world. He so loved the world. The world is the object of God's love. I love what Jesus says here. um, Because when Jesus says this, he says this to a Jewish audience that would have typically believed that God's love was only for those who were of Jewish tradition or were the people of Israel. And I love that in John 3, 16, a verse that we know so well, Jesus is tearing down cultural walls. Like he is in the midst of blowing our minds and shattering stereotypes about who can be loved. He's saying, no, everyone, everyone can experience my love. What this means for you is that you have a place in this house. It doesn't matter your nationality, your profession, whether you're upper class or you're lower class, married or single, whether you have a house or you don't even have a house at all, your status does not qualify you as loved. Your God does. The second thing we can see from this is that God is in the business of reconciling all creation back to him. 
that at the fall, our sin, when sin entered the world, it broke God's heart and it separated us from God and everything was affected at the fall. Not just us, everything. And God is in the midst of saying, no, I love the world so much that what's gonna happen here is that I'm gonna reconcile all of it back to, to myself. But in order for us to realize the significance of this verse, you need to also recognize the significance that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. I, um, when I first got into ministry, I was 19, and I was working in um, our leadership development program at our Milton campus. And I was young, I was broke, I was trying to figure out my life, didn't know what ministry looked like. I was working for Joey, it was wild. Um, if you wanna fast track into ministry, just go follow him for 12 months, it'll get you there fast. Um, but I'll never forget, I was on my way to work one day, and I got hit by a car, and my, my car, I wasn't like, riding a bike or anything, like I was driving, don't worry, I'm okay. Um, but I was driving my car and I got hit and um, my car was kind of a piece of poo-poo and so they were like, hey, this thing's totaled, it's not, it's not gonna work out. Um, and so they gave me a check for $1,000. They gave me a check for $1,000 for my car. And again, I'm 19 and I'm like, great, I'm gonna go buy a sweet car. And then for those of you who've been adulting, you can't buy a car for $1,000. <laughs> Um, and so I remember being anxious about it and hitching rides and uh, borrowing cars. And for three weeks, I'm just searching for a car, searching for a car. Um, until one day, a guy in my small group calls me out of nowhere and he goes, hey, um, I, I, I want you to know, Thomas, that you're so loved and that there are a group of people who care for you and believe in you and they love you. And so we wanna give you $1,000 for your car to get, to get another car added to the fund. And I'm just like, no, like, you really don't have to do that. Thank you. But like, seriously, you don't have to do that. And he goes, you're right. We don't have to do that. We're going to give you $2,000 for your car. I'm like, okay, um, no, you don't have to do that. Please stop. Like, it's okay. And he goes, you're right. We don't have to do that. We're going to give you $3,000 for your car. And that night I had $3,000 in my Venmo account. Like it blew my mind. Um, but yeah, someone gave me this. Like this is something that a group of people gave me. It was mine. It was mine to have. In Elevate City, we need to see that the kind of gave that God is talking about here, that he is doing with his son, is the kind that comes with no givebacks. Like he gave. And he gave up his son. He gave him to die. He gave him as a substitute. He gave him as a payment. Like God, he gave his son to the most gruesome death so that we could experience the most glorious life. Do you realize that this is the kind of gave that we're talking about in John 3, 16? It was given to us. I love that in John, 1 John chapter 3, God's love is said to be lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. The definition of lavish is to bestow something in generous or extravagant quantities, to spend, to heap, to shower, to pour, to give generously or bestow freely. Tonight we need to see that God has bestowed his son to us. He has given his son to us. Do you see God's love this way? Have you realized that his love has been lavished on you? But in order to realize the significance of this verse, you also need to recognize the significance that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave his only son. The son is the greatest gift. Let me tell you about Jesus in Matthew 17, uh, verse one, starting in verse one, it says, after six days, Jesus took him, Peter and James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not the time, Peter. And he was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and they were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. 
when God looks, God the Father looks at Jesus and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, it completely sets Jesus apart. The son had a special place in the father's heart. He was the greatest gift we could have been given. Jesus tonight and every day is the demonstration of love that our souls are longing for. Jesus is the gift that our souls are longing for. Jesus is the prize. Do you wanna know how much God loves you? Look at Jesus. If you wanna know how much he cares for you, look at Jesus. Jesus is the gift that is given to us. I love that if we look at historical context, at the time in history of where they're at right now, um, the firstborn son would have been the most important asset to a family. Like it would have been the most valuable gift to any royal family. And this is what God gives us. He gives us his son. There is nothing more priceless, nothing more sacred, nothing more precious than a firstborn only son. There's nothing that compares to this. Like hear me say this, no gift that you will ever be given, no engagement ring, no wedding day, nothing will compare to the love of Jesus, to the gift of Jesus, no experience that you are sent on, nothing that anyone gives you, no amount of money will compare to the gift that Jesus is to us. This is how God chooses to show his love. But in order to realize the significance of this verse, you also need to recognize the significance that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, whoever. I love that Jesus says this word, whoever. We cannot miss this simple word, whoever. This is one of the most beautiful things about scripture is because you can find so much truth and rich beauty in one single word of whoever. One writer says that when Jesus says whoever, it flings open the gates of paradise. Like it flings open the gates of who can experience love. Well, what about the murderer? Yeah, the thief on the right, he is the whoever. Well, what about the doubter? Yeah, Thomas, the disciple, he's the whoever. Well, what about the lustful? Oh yeah, the woman caught in adultery. She is the whoever. This is good news, church. Like some of you are thinking, this message is not for me. I can never experience the love of God. Like you're sitting here and you're going, nope, John 3, 16 was not meant for me. It is not for me. I can't experience that love. Like, do you know what I've done? Do you know the sins that I've committed? Do you know the people that I've hurt? Do you know the lies that I've told of? And Jesus is saying, you are the whoever. Like you can experience love tonight. This message is for you. You can be loved. You are not too far gone. And the gates of God's love have burst open for you tonight in this simple word, whoever. But in order to realize the significance of this verse, you also need to recognize the significance that God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes, believes. This whoever has a condition, and that condition is belief. Romans 10, 9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've had the opportunity over the past couple of years to be able to sit across from so many people of different faith and different backgrounds, um, been able to sit with people who are Buddhist or people who are Hindu, uh, Lauren reminded me today that in college I joined a Muslim ping pong club. It was out of control, but it was awesome. Um, and they're really good at ping pong. Um, but I'll never, um, I'll never forget just some of these conversations that I got to have with people who believed in different things. And the conversation always got to this one point. It always got to the question of how do you experience love from God? How do you experience love from God? And they would share, and in each of these set of beliefs, there would be this order of things that they must do in order to get approval from God, in order to be seen as righteous or holy. And what we believe is that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you experience the love of God. Like this is our call. Our call, what we believe is to 
to believe, not imagine, not wonder. This is not make-believe. This is not a fairy tale. It is to say that Jesus really came and really died on a cross and really paid the penalty for our sin. Our call is to confess and believe that Jesus is the gift, that God gave him to us and he gave him for us. But in order for us to realize the significance of this verse, you also need to recognize the significance that God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Perish. I think just like some of us have become desensitized to the reality of God's love, some of us have become desensitized to our sin. We've forgotten that Romans 6, 23 says the wages of our sin is death. Like what happened at the fall, is sin entered the world and it's created this separation from God. It created this separation from God. And we believe at this church that there is a real, literal place called hell and that people's souls are really going there. We believe that those who do not confess and believe that Jesus is Lord will spend an eternity apart from God and they will never know the love of God. Does this break your heart? Do we see this tonight that we exist to go and tell people about who Jesus is and to invite them to experience this love? Like, does the love of God compel you so much to realize that people are really perishing but their souls do not have to? Like there is another way when you understand the love of God, you understand that God's love is so big, it is so wide, it is so vast that he doesn't let our story end with this. He doesn't let our story end with this. There is another way. And in order for you to realize the significance of this verse, you also need to recognize the significance that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have. Before Jesus is about to die on the cross, he has an experience with the thief next to him. I just want to read this story for us. Luke chapter 23. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In a single moment, in a couple sentences, this man hanging on a cross next to Jesus experiences the love of God. Like it's for him to have. It's given to him. This means that God, he's not just going to take his love away from you. Like, do you have that understanding of God's love tonight that it's just there one day and gone the next? Because that is not the love of God. It is given for us to have, to delight in, to enjoy, to experience. The word have is our great assurance. Have means to possess or own. An eternal life, it is not a concept for us to think about, it is an experienced reality for us to have. This is for us to have. But in order for us to realize the significance of this verse, you need to also recognize the significance that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If we go back to the first word, we remember a holy God. It's a holy God who has no beginning. He's always been. And we see that this gift, this eternal life has no end. There's no end. All of this will pass away hear me say that tonight, all of this will pass away. The jobs we work, the savings that we save, the experiences we have, no matter how beautiful that they are, it's going to pass away. The movies that we watch, the things that we waste our time on, all of it will pass away. 
this one hurts my heart, but the rounds of golf, they're going to pass away. <laughs> Every Amazon purchase we make, all of it will pass away except this eternal promise. The, this eternal life is the great promise. And this doesn't just change your eternity. This changes you now. Like, see that there is a holy God who loves you so much that he saves you for eternal life. And we get to enjoy love now. We get to experience God's love now. It's not just waiting for us on the other side of eternity. Like, it's here now. Like, we get to experience the love of God now. Elevate City, do you see how much God loves you? that he loves you and he loves you and he loves you. Like Jesus sent his son, Jesus came to die on a cross for you, personally, for your sin. Do we see the love of God this way? I wanna close with something special. Um, this upcoming January, Lauren and I are gonna be parents um, and we're extremely excited. Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't know how to pray for us, just pray for, like, the kid thing, because we need prayer for that, like anyone does, and we don't know what we've just gotten ourselves into. Um, but I've loved this journey so far. We found out that we're having a son, and it's just been so fun being on this journey with Lauren. Um, I love so many things about this journey. I love praying for him. Like, every day I love praying for him. I love feeling him kick. Like, I love feeling him move. Um, I'll never forget the first time we saw the ultrasound. Um, I was sitting there, and Lauren and I were sitting there, and we just didn't say a word to each other. Like, we just stared at the screen, and we just, like, tears came down our faces as we stared at our son for the first time. Um, but every, every appointment, every time you go to this appointment, they, they play his heartbeat. Like, they play his heartbeat, and I love to hear his heartbeat. Like, his heartbeat is the favorite, my favorite noise. Like, I love to hear it. I love to just listen to it. Um, so much so that I got a recording so all of you guys could hear this heartbeat. Um, so I just want you to listen to the heartbeat of my son. He's going crazy in there. Every time I hear this heartbeat, every time I listen to this heartbeat, I feel myself going, I love you, I love you, I love you. Like I haven't even met him yet. And I just, every time I hear it, I just go, I love you, I love you, I love you. Like I can't wait to meet you. I can't wait to hold you. I can't wait to touch you and pray for you and see you grow up. Like every time I hear that heartbeat, I just over and over, my heart just goes, I love you. I love you, I love you. This does not even compare to the love of God. Like this does not even compare to the love of God. Like if you wanna know the heartbeat that God has for you, look at Jesus. If you wanna know the heartbeat of how much God the Father loves you, look at Jesus, look at the moment that he sends his son to die because of our sin on a cross so that we could be adopted into his family. Like look at the, the moment that he sends his son. I can't fathom the pain and anguish that God the Father went through when he intentionally put his son in harm's way so that we could experience this kind of love. Like I imagine God the Father hearing the heartbeat of Jesus for the first time in the manger. I just imagine he was going, I love you, I love you, I love you. I, I just imagine, you know, when Jesus in Matthew 17 and God, the Father looks at him, he says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. I imagine he was going, I love you, I love you, I love you. And as Jesus was betrayed by Judas and God the Father was going, I love you, I love you, I love you. And as Jesus carried his cross up to Calvary and he was exerting all of his energy, he was going, I love you, I love you, I love you. And as he breathed his last breath and he was sitting on that cross, imagine God looked at us and he said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Do you see how much God loves you? Do you see how much he loves you? that right now he is sitting here and he hears your heartbeat and he's going, I love you, I love you, I love you. If 
you don't believe me, look at Jesus. Look at what Jesus did on the cross. Look how much I love you. Elevate City, we have to see that God loves us so much. We are loved beyond belief. We can't even fathom the love that God has for us. This love was not easy. This love was purchased at Calvary for you and I. This love cannot be desensitized. It cannot be forgotten. It cannot be overlooked. Just because we've heard this verse over and over again does not take away the reality and truth of God's love. It is more vast than the biggest valleys. It is higher than the highest mountains and it is clear and more beautiful than the starry skies. Do you see this love tonight or have you forgotten it?